So welcome back everyone, Campuseros, other visitors for our uh, afternoon program of speakers. Um, really happy that you're all here. I hope you're still awake after lunch, feeling energized enough. Well, we have got a great set of speakers for you, so they will definitely keep you uh, awake. Our next uh, topic is uh, gaming. And I thought preparing for this, I, I remembered my very first game I had as a kid. I actually had it still at home, so I thought to introduce it, I will just bring it. This is, this is really retro. You remember it? It's a Commodore game, it's really easy. Well, I thought it was really difficult. You have two buttons, just two, and you uh, uh, had to uh, bring frogs from one end of the pond to the other. So this was gaming for me when I grew up. Uh, gaming, of course, uh, has come a long way uh, since it, and of course I played the epic uh, lesser shoot Larry, <laughs> which I loved. So that was that was for me, but gaming, of course, has come uh, far from that. Uh, today, it's a huge industry, so we want to have special attention on this stage. My name is Brechtje de Leij. I will be uh, your moderator uh, for the talks during this stage, so I will help you with any questions you may have for our speakers later on. can hand you over a mic, and of course, I'll uh, introduce them properly. Our first one of four is J.P. van Zeventer. Uh, he left his mark on the very early phases of the Dutch gaming industry. Uh, he started the Dutch Game Garden uh, as a development director. Today he's their final boss, leading the strategic direction of the company. Um, Dutch Game Garden also has an exhibit uh, uh, in the exhibit area. They have a spot, so definitely check them out later. You can play all sorts of games there, so check it out later. But now as a talk. In his talk he will answer questions like, what does it take to build a successful and sustainable game company? Who do you include in your team? What skills do you need? And his Twitter bio says that he thinks the future of education it is in building games. So that's an interesting viewpoint for this audience. Please welcome JP on the stage. Thank you. Great, thank you, Brechtje. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah? I was just curious, before I continue, um, how many of you are in school right now and how many of you are doing a technical education and any of you doing a business education yeah <laughs> and any of you doing a creative education all right any other kind of any others i missed okay so what school are you the business uh, person Where, what school are you in okay excellent and what do you want to be when you grow up Okay, that makes sense. All right, thank you. Well, um, I'm JP, um, which stands for Jan Peter, but it's a little easier in international context. Uh, I work for Dutch Game Garden, uh, and I'll give you a bit of a presentation about myself and about the companies we work with, and then I'll g give you 10 things that I think you should ma look at if you're interested in having a games company. Any of you want to start a games company? All right, and I'll <laughs> three. All right, great, so I hope I entertain the rest of you. So, um, my background is, uh, it's, it's not working, chief. I hate, um, it's not working. All right, my background is industrial design. Um, oh, I'm a bit confused, is it working? On oh, on off, ah, there you go. This is what I do right now. I'm involved in all sorts of schools and education for games. Um, my background is industrial design and through 3D drawing, I got into <laughs> game design. So my first games I worked on were Davilex. Anybody here heard of Davilex games? Ah, see. Any of you play Red Cat? It's my first game I worked on. So um, that's kind of where I got my start. Uh, after that, I worked for a couple of years in the mobile game industry. This is before the iPhone, so this is a long time ago in, in terms of mobile speech. Um, and then I s helped start a studio in Amsterdam. Today it's known as Force Fields. It started as W Games and we built a horseback riding game. So in order to build a good horseback riding game, I actually had to take horseback riding lessons, which was quite an experience, together with all the programmers and artists and stuff. So what I love about games is it is creating worlds. So you really make small little worlds. And we're basically bringing this to life. This is how my daughter plays with toys and stuff. And this is 
my first computer, the Amstrad Schneider 64. Any of, any of you know that computer? It was the cheap alternative for the Commodore, which was a little more expensive. My brother and I bought this uh, with our paper route money. Um, that's where I got my start. Whoa. What is... I think I hit a button that I wasn't supposed to hit. Martin, rescue me. You click on this button. Yeah. And that's uh, you will stop the presentation. Okay, thanks. So I think what's really cool about games is we borrow things from the real world, but we build our own alternative little worlds. Simply because reality is the most boring game ever. What does this mean in the Netherlands? The Netherlands is, there's a lot going on. I started in the industry in 98. That is centuries ago in the game industry. Um, we had seven companies in the Netherlands at that time. And we've had an incredible growth since then. We're up to 455 games companies in the Netherlands, ranging from guerrilla games with more than 200 people and having one person studios right at the Dutch Game Garden. Um, and the main, the fastest growth has been around this time for several reasons. One, we've had schools here in Utrecht starting a game program around 2002. The University of Utrecht and the HQU School of the Arts, they started school programs. Also, we had digital distribution coming up and we had mobile coming up. And it was really easy to start your own company and make small games. Uh, today, we have 1,600 students coming out of schools each year with a degree. So we have more than 30 schools doing a games program. 600 of those go back to the next school, but we have at least 1,000 entering the market today. So where are we going to put all these people? If you can see, we have only 3,000 jobs. So that's a challenge. Well, the answer is you all start your own company. This is where it's distributed. Um, we're pretty good at building entertainment games, but we're also pretty good at building applied games. So we have a lot of applied gaming as well going on. Um, this is a bit where the jobs are distributed. And this is where um, basically, this is what it looks like today, but it's gonna change and grow. This is where we are right now. And we also have a location in Breda and in Hilversum. And these are some of the companies in our building. And we mix experienced companies with young talents. Um, so the first of the 10 easy st the steps to do a start a good games company, I'm going to borrow this quote from Martin de Ronde. He co-founded Guerrilla Games back in the days. And he told us that the reason that they got their start is because they had a shooter game concept on PS2 or even yeah, PS2 and Sony didn't have a, a shooter and they needed one because Halo had just come out and because Halo had come out they needed to answer that to Microsoft with a shooter and they didn't have one and Guerrilla came with exactly what they needed so they were the first the cool thing about being the first is that you're automatically the, the best that's the whole point point. Um, and I think it was really good and it it's really good for you to realize what is not there yet and what can we contribute to that so today, this is their company. It's more than 200 people, and they build awesome stuff. But it started with a couple of guys and a demo on a piece two. Second is pick the right team skills. So first of all, what people usually do is they find the skills that they're lacking themselves, I hope, at least when it comes to development. If I'm an artist and I don't have a programmer, I really am not going to get very far. So that's what usually happens. So if you map out game teams, Using this little diagram, you can roughly break them down in four types. In the arts, I kind of lump music and storytelling in there as well. These are the four main categories people have to be part of. Game programming, arts, game design, and business administration. Most of the teams that are coming out of the HQU School of the Arts, they look like this. They're very much on the art side, design. Some of them can script a little bit. Sometimes you're lucky with a programmer there, but it's usually this profile. This is the profile that kind of comes from the university computer science, right, all into, into programming. But this is what happens if you have a startup from a business school. They can only write business plans, but they don't know how to build anything. So there's an imbalance there, and we need to fix that. So this would be an ideal situation. So when you look for your team, look in these areas, but don't forget this person here. 
most creative schools, most schools that are producing game companies today are creative schools of creation. There's not much business going on. So either you have to become that business person yourself or you have to find someone who loves doing that. This is basically what we get at the Dutch Game Garden, 80% of the creative types. Other thing that students usually don't realize is that they're not just starting to build a project, they're building a company. So that's what you really have to realize is think about what it means to have a company. I see two kinds of management roughly in all the games companies in the Netherlands. One is the person who sacrificed his or her ambition as an artist or a, a programmer and became the CEO. And the other type is somebody from the outside with a business degree. That's why I was looking at you. We need you. So um, we don't have enough of those. So basically this is what companies today that have grown. And if I see who manages this, Guerrilla is managed by somebody who loves to manage and doesn't have any other, any, any other creative pretensions. He's only focusing on management and he likes that. And some of the other great company, Code Glue, awesome company, they're in our, uh, on our stand. It's a great company, but they are always around 10 people. And they like to manage, but they also still like to get be, be uh, part of development. These guys here are Vlambeer. Does anybody know Vlambeer? They're a really interesting bunch. They actually don't even like each other that much, but they really complement each other in skill. One is an extremely good designer, and he can prototype, he builds his own stuff with Game Maker. And Rami is an exceptional entrepreneurial guy with an exceptionally good mind for marketeering and PR. And together, they do quite well. Um, so we need to balance those types out. Now, these are all the schools in the Netherlands that do something with game development. There's none in there that are doing really business. So we need those business guys. If we want more guerrilla games, we need some more business guys or girls. The next thing is pick the right team, deep motivation. People want to be have a games company for all sorts of reasons. Uh, this is a motivation of this really famous game developer in the US, Stormfront Entertainment. And this is his reason to build games. He doesn't really want to be an entrepreneur, but he sees entrepreneurship as a way to build what he wants. That's interesting. Most business schools, people are taught to want to be an entrepreneur. That's not really his main goal. His main goal is to build what he wants. And that's the motivation of most of our companies. And basically, if you look at this sort of, this is mainstream games, say EA, this is Vlam Vlambeer, it's right there. And this is somebody who just builds games as an artist. If we want to have a successful game echoes here in the Netherlands, we need to move sort of from this that way. But this has to do with deep motivation. Why do you want to build games? What is your motivation? Do you want to be an artist and starve in a caravan? That's fine, but make it a conscious decision. Um, if you want to have a successful games company, you need to start thinking about business. If I look at the first 20 startups that I helped, if you look at the left, it's the DNA of the founders, did the founders switch team? Did people leave the team or not? The ones in red are all the teams that changed. The ones that are the successful are the ones mostly that the core didn't change. So it's really important to pick the right people for their motivation because the motivations can differ. I've had several companies fall apart because one person had a complete different motivation than the others, but they didn't know exactly what the deep motivation was. So you have to find out. Um, so pick the right person, personality. There's such lots of different types of people in the world, and they're kind of, you can map them in all sorts of ways. Uh, we use the DISC program. It was invented by Mr. Gear. Trust me, it's really interesting. But it breaks people down in four types, and then in another, maps them out. And what it basically says is, you are kind of this type of person, you are kind of this type of person. Now, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but what I have seen, the successful companies that I have seen always have one dominant person in there. And the ones who don't seem to really get going is when the three founders are all in this category. And so that is an interesting uh, thing because if it's people who are really stable and conscientious, those are also the ones who like to postpone decisions endlessly. So if these are all the founders and they're continually trying to figure out what's the next step and make the game better and better and better, but not really think about making hard choices, 
that's why these kinds of things are important. So we look at this model and we use it to help people understand, companies understand themselves. Um, when you build a company, you build a company and not a product. So I set that up before. So really you have to think about what kind of company do I want to be in five years and not just think about the game that you want to build right now. And also it's good to use business model canvas where you really kind of get an idea of what my company is going to be like and where am I going to fit in the space. Anybody ever use this? Okay, great. It's already been pretty integrated. It's a great tool. Um, oh, never mind. Um, now you can choose entertainment games, serious gaming. Who's ever played a serious game? All right, so it's pretty known right now. I don't have to ask, okay, let me do it. Who's ever played an entertainment game? Pretty much the same, a little more. You can choose today. You just, there, there's a lot of fun to be had with both of them. Um, these guys here came from the university, built a really cool game called Reus, and sold 800,000 copies in the first uh, half year of the production, or uh, in the release. It took them a year and a half to build. This was a, a cool story. It's exciting. It's like a, it's like a storybook. But they also discovered it's really hard. The industry of the entertainment gaming is hard because it's very hit or miss. If you, ha if you, have, if you fail, you have nothing to fall back on. So it's really tough business, but it can, it can work. Um, these guys have done really well. They sold a couple of games. This is their, one of their first famous games, and they broke even in two hours in the App Store. So they really knew how to generate uh, attention for their game. This is hit or miss though. It's really hit or miss. So, so far they're surviving, but there's a safer business model and it can be a lot of fun as well for serious gaming. Has anybody played the demo yesterday where there's a simulation of uh, operation game at our uh, stand? There's somebody right there, yeah. This guy has to train to be a surgeon and it's really boring. You know keyhole operations when people operate in the stomach through a little hole and they they basically control these two things to operate. It's really hard to do. It's kind of like cutting your hair in the mirror. And so you have to learn these skills. So these guys in Leeuwarden produced a game where you actually play an arcade game and you actually develop the motor skills that you need to operate successful. So you're actually using, this is the arcade world that you're playing in. So it's a really different way of looking at game and as uh, technology. Another example from our uh, incubation program is uh, the Tovertafel. Anybody ever seen this? It's for elderly. Yeah. Uh, it's somewhere on the stand here, uh, somewhere. Basically, it's elderly being reactivated by game technology. This thing projects on any, any table and it gets people to be mo uh, react to stuff that's on the table. And it's really a great way to uh, build a games copy. And they're doing actually really well. They're selling these really fast right now. So it's going very well. Um, another thing, when you start a games company, it's good to have a legal foundation. When you start a games company with your friends, people are usually think, oh, because they're my friends, things will be okay. Well, actually, I would even say that with friends, you should even have even better contracts because things can go really wrong. Um, so, for example, if there's four of you and you have a company together and one of you wants to leave after a year, who gets the IP? Who gets the ideas? Who owns it? If you don't have any uh, contracts with that at the beginning, it can get really ugly. And we've seen some very ugly situations. So right now we give people contracts to add to the Chamber of Commerce contracts about IP because there's always a fight about that. So if you ever want, want to know more about it, come and contact us. Um, then about the teams also in terms of contracts, I think that the founders should really uh, be uh, equal creative and business types uh, in the same terms. So basically, if you look at all successful games companies combining the business and the creative, like Epic Games, Pixar, Apple, it's good that the founders are both locked into the owner sphere. So I really think that Good, successful, creative companies should always have uh, the creatives and the business types and the technologists in one layer. You should not just be a business CEO and then have just the creatives under you. That can work, but
but I think if you want to have a long, sustainable company, the creatives should have an equal strong voice. And that you can make sure you, you, you put that together in the founders layer. So just an example, I does anybody know Epic Games? Yeah. Mark, I've met him, I've tried to buy their engine. So they're completely different guys. Mark is the business guy and Tim is the creative programmer. He's an amazing genius. They both need each other. They're very different. He can be kind of an asshole, but he's a very interesting guy and he knows what he's doing. But <laughs> he needs him. He's very much a creative and he would sell, you, he would almost give you the engine, you know? So it's just like this tension, but they're both owner. So they fight, but they have a very good company. And last point is start now. You want to know why? If you're still students, your life is cheap. This is your life. Your expenses, let's say that expenses, your, your red thing is your thousand, maybe, who lives off a thousand euros a month, roughly? Well, you have a thousand coming in, you're, you're, you have a thousand going out. So when you get a girlfriend or a boyfriend or a partner, whatever, your expenses go up. And your second one, when you have an apartment and your first vacation, your expenses go up. And down the road, when you're, well, this is where I am, these are my expenses. I'm not gonna tell you exactly Nah, it's not roughly, it's not exactly that, but your expenses are going to go up. So if I'm going to start a company today, it's much more risky. So that's why if you're in your 20s right now, I would say start today. So this, this summer, if you're interested, we have a program where you can participate for a week and build games together, talk about the business, talk about the games, build them and produce them. It's going to be in the summer. So if you have time and you want to sign up, there's a little flyers there and hope we can continue this discussion in the future. Uh, and that's it. Right. Thank you very much. Do we have questions from the audience? Anyone? Yes, over there. <laughs> Here's the mic. Hi, I'm the business guy, as you yes, said. Yes, we need you. <laughs> yeah. uh, what do you think about the, the way the industry is moving towards games that are being monetized with like in-app purchase. Uh, like free to play? Uh, yeah, so free to play is a big thing. And if you're not free to play, it's very hard to get people to buy your game because there's so many free games out there. And then the gaming experience is pretty terrible because you end up winning by buying in almost all free games. How can the industry solve this problem? Do you see it as a problem? Uh, this is a big thing. I mean, game designers have been discussing this for the last few years. There's always a tension between is it still fun and am I making money? I think free to play works for certain kind of games. I think it works if you do it well. If I know there also are examples of where as a player, I find it very annoying. Uh, and I also don't think it's the holy grail. It was the holy grail three years ago. I don't believe it is the holy grail. It will always exist. But I also think there's lots of games where it just doesn't work. So do you have any advice on people who, who don't want to use the model but still want to try to sell their games? What would your advice be? Well, I would say first advice is read a lot about what's going on because there's always someone who finds something new. I think also there's always uh, another way of making money with games. I think there's always room for creative products that are just premium, just bought up. I think there's always room for that. The only problem is the app stores are so full, it's really hard to get noticed uh, and to get a sustainable model. Uh, free to play, I believe it's a sustainable model, it works but it's not the only one. And I think if you, also you need a lot of money to do it right. So if you're just by yourself, I don't think you should do a free to play game, no. Yeah. More questions? Yeah, over there. First, thanks for the talk. Um, I'm curious about what's the role of the Dutch Game Garden into the company. Like you said, you have a lot of companies, Yeah. but do you help with the publishing on Steam? Do you help, are, are you just a facilitator for the offices? Yeah. What's the role? Yeah, we help people with strategy, we help them with, we coach them, we help them, first of all, make sure that they really know what best strategy is for them. And then if they need connections, if they need to be connected, we help them, we connect them to uh, Steam if we have to, or we help them with somebody who knows, who can help them. So yeah, that's what we do, we facilitate. And if it's really necessary, we'll help them make a deal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's room, I think, for a last question. Anyone? None, but one for me. Yeah. You said you need a business guy. Now, well, we have now one here. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So everyone needs to connect with you. Yeah. But how do you find the business guy? Because 
I mean, th this if you just, you know, uh, portray them like suits and geeks, they don't come into the same well bar. So how do they yeah, hook up? Yeah, well, in the Netherlands, we raise them in separately, right? So we have creative schools, we have business schools, and it can be a girl through, by the way. How huh? you know that, right? But yeah. uh, it's it's how do we find them? I think less than five percent of business school people would want to be a CEO of a games company. But that five percent, I'm interested in, and it just means getting them to come to our events, getting them to participate in the summer program. That's one of our challenges, is to, yep. we're talking to Nairode, to Erasmus, mm. to other schools, to see if we can get that few, those few students who want to do this. So that's how we do it. If you're somebody yourself, then yeah, go around, look around, find them in the places where you know that they hang out. And that's usually not at a creative school, so yeah. <laughs> it's a challenge. Okay, yeah. we have a couple of minutes of uh, changing mics for our next speaker uh, on, on game. So stick around, sit, maybe you can ask him a couple of yeah. more questions yeah. while we yeah. change the mics. Yeah. Oh, and you have and can one I ask last thing. The next speaker, Mark, is one of the co-founders of the Dutch Game Garden. So I'm really excited that he's here today. So yeah. Yeah. We as well. So right, thank great. you. Stick around for a couple of minutes. We'll uh, change mics. Okay, thank you.